home prices relative to any way you look at it, relative to income, relative to net worth, relative to historical trends are so broken right now uh, and broken in a way that we have really never seen. start, Morgan, if an alien came down from another planet right now and asked Morgan Housel, what is going on with housing in the United States? Where would you begin? I would begin with two points, one that kind of starts 10 or 15 years ago and one that is much more recent. The point that starts 10 or 15 years ago is it's always fascinating to me how deep the roots of our problems go. And this root, this root is not even that deep, but if you go back to the end of the housing bubble, 2006, 2007, why there was a housing bubble in the 2000s is because we built way too many homes, massive overconstruction, way too many homes that we needed. And then everything fell to pieces in 2008 and the housing, the housing industry kind of disintegrated. That was caused the financial crisis. A big part of that was after the housing bubble burst, millions of American contractors and carpenters and electricians and plumbers went out of business. They went and found something else to do. There was no more work for them. So if you were a plumber in Dallas, Texas, you hadn't found something else to do. You did not wait for your plumbing business to come back. You were gone. A lot of mom and pop contractors just went out of business. And what took their place were the giant home builders. But there are literally tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of mom and pop contractors that used to build two homes a year, three homes a year that went out of business in 2008 and they never came back. Once demand for housing came back, in the mid 20 teens, 2013, 14, 15, those people who found something else to do, they did not go back to housing. They found, they were working at auto plants and they were working, you know, building solar panels. They, they did not do, they did not come back to housing. And you can't just snap your fingers and create a new set of a million electricians, which is just to say that for most of the last decade, we have been way short of home builders and home building technicians, carpenters, electricians, those kind of people, way short. So there was a massive underbuilding of homes for the last 10 years. We, we are probably short today, something like 3 million homes that we need. We, we need 3 million more homes for sale today than we actually have. And that creates all kinds of problems. It basically just shifts up um, like the housing uh, conveyor belt, where it's like, it used to be that rich people lived in mansions and middle-class people lived in middle-class homes and poor people lived in low-income housing. And that just shifted up. So now it's like, you know, the 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 very, very rich live in the nice homes. The middle-class live in the lower-end homes. And the lower-class people, there is virtually nothing left, which is kind of literally uh, instigated the rise of homelessness and the opioid epidemic, even like you can draw straight lines between these things. I just bring that up because I think a lot of what has happened over the last two or three years is we have this massive house housing shortage combined with because of the pandemic, people are spending way more time at home working for home. So housing means a lot more to them than it used to be combined with the third, the second, the third element here, which is that because the stock market boomed and crypto wealth boomed, you all of a sudden have a small sliver of society, not everyone, but a small sliver that has tons of money to throw around. When you put those three things together, home prices in the last two years, pretty much since the start of COVID, have gone vertical in a way that puts the housing bubble of the early 2000s to absolute shame. And so home prices relative to any way you look at it, relative to income, relative to net worth, relative to historical trends are so broken right now uh, and broken in a way that we have really never seen. That's that's the that's the big picture area of where we are, and there's a couple other elements of like why it could persist or what could break it, but that's that's where we are today. And and those are kind of the macro factors that led to this feeding frenzy in the real estate market that we saw last year. Yeah, and and really what keeps that going and why the feeding frenzy is so persistent and why it perpetually leaves a class of people out is this. Let's say let's just use a round number to keep it even. Let's say you buy a house that costs a million dollars. And then because we're in this crazy housing period, it doubles in value. So now all of a sudden your house is worth $2 million. If you sell that $2 million house and pocket $2 million, by and large, what you are going to do is use the proceeds to go buy another house. So the other house that you are going to go and buy, the fact that that house also doubled in value doesn't matter that much because you are using proceeds from a house that also doubled in value. So if you are an existing homeowner, then the rise in home prices I don't want to be too flippant with this statement, almost doesn't make that much of a difference to you because the new homes cost twice as much as they used to, but the house you're selling is worth twice as much as it used to. Now, if you are a new, a first-time homeowner 
then in that situation, in that world, you are screwed because the homes for sale cost twice as much as they did two years ago, but you do not have a house that doubled in value to sell to use for the down payment. So it creates this perpetual system where if you own a house, your wealth goes up and up and up and up and up. And if you don't own a house, you're never getting into the game. It's not going to happen unless you have a rich parent or a rich uncle who's going to make your down payment. Good luck. I would hate to be a first time homeowner looking in this world where two years ago, home prices were not cheap by any metric. They were expensive two years ago. And then they doubled in two years and you have to come up with a down payment in cash out of your pocket to get in that game, to join the club. Good luck. So that's why I think, I think there, there, it creates a situation where I think half the country does not understand the other half. You have half the country who says, how could anyone ever afford a house? I don't know how you people do it. And then the other half is like, real estate's great. I bought a house and made a ton of money. Why, 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 why can't you do what I did? And you get these two groups that are just like spread further and further apart. Sure. And, and you know, you basically just described my situation and I'll use myself as an example because I think there are a lot of other people like me, but I, I'm a white collar worker. I make a very good living. I have a pretty good amount of money saved up. Um, I don't have family help. I live in California and I'm looking at this market right now, trying to buy my first home. And I'm just like, what, where do I start here? Um, it's a joke. Yeah. And, and it, and it almost, you know, you, you get caught in these guilt trips cycles where you feel like you're doing something wrong. It, it does help to kind of zoom out and try to understand those macro factors that underlie everything. And you get these really weird situations where particularly like in the Bay Area or Seattle where I live, you have tech workers who make a million dollars a year and they live in a two bedroom rambler with peeling paint because that's what, like it, everything got so broken that now if you make a million dollars a year, that two bedroom ran, rambler in Palo Alto might cost $3 million. And therefore someone who has like a crazy high income, that's the market that they can afford. And then you push that down the list so now the person who used to live in the two bedroom Rambler was like a middle-class worker making 50 grand. Now that worker, because all the two bedroom Ramblers are bought by the tech workers, the person who's making 50 grand is all of a sudden in low income housing. And the people who used to be in low income housing are homeless. That's a, that's a, I think that's a, a very simplified version, but I think that story has played out millions of times over the last decade. And again, I kind of hinted at this earlier. There are all these societal implications of this, of you can draw a straight line between that housing shortage and the opioid epidemic. Those two things perfectly align with if people's lives fall apart because they don't have stable shelter, their, their whole entire social lives fall apart, starts to crumble. And you, you start, you know, you are more attracted, more appealed Sure. to the uh, the riskier solutions in life. And some of those underlying inventory issues you mentioned, uh, they obviously still exist. You know, the number of building permits and housing starts still haven't recovered from 2008. Inventory is is at an all-time low. <laughs> um, what are, like, is there any silver lining here? Like, what, what are we looking at in terms of solutions in the housing market? What needs to happen for things to... Re return to some semblance of normalcy here. One interesting thing is that the number of homes that are under construction right now, that are under construction but not completed, is very high. They are, my understanding is they are by and large not being completed at any significant rate because of the supply chain shortage. And I think this has eased up a little bit, but you hear stories last summer of homes that were completely built and ready to go except for a garage door or except for toilets, or except for one little thing that they could not get because of the supply chain crisis. And because of how the permitting works, maybe these are good rules to have, but you cannot sell a house that has everything but a garage door. You cannot sell, that house is incomplete. You cannot sell it to a person who's gonna move into it. You can't do it. And so you had a lot of these homes that are 90% finished, 99% finished, but they are not 100% finished, so you can't sell them. I think that's easing up a little bit, but even if we had a big rise in construction over the last two years, it hasn't led to finished housing units that people can actually buy to any significant degree. But I think that that is easing up. So that's one potential solution is within the next year or two, the number of new homes that will come onto the market is going to be much higher than it's been in years. That's one part of it. The other part of this, that's kind of a two sided thing is um, the generational transfer of housing units from baby boomers who are passing away to their children or to just coming onto the market. That's a big thing. There's also another side of this though, which is that if you um, have a 3% mortgage rate and you locked it in at 3% years ago, and now mortgage rates are five and a half or 6%, 
you are very reluctant to sell because the new house that you buy is going to have a way higher interest rate. So when interest rates rise, you have way more people who may want to sell their home. They may want to move, but they say, actually, I don't want to do it because I don't want to reset my mortgage at 6%. So then you take all those people who are otherwise would be sellers and they're not anymore. So there's, there's, you know, it's coming from all different angles. There's some things that are getting better. Some things are getting worse. In general, it's just a, a wild time to be in this industry. And I don't know if I see anything that would be the the equivalent of what we did like after World War II of just like, let's just go out and build 10 million new homes for all the returning GIs. There's nothing in the pipeline that's like that. If I had to guess, I'm not a forecaster and I think people are very bad at forecasting, but if I had to like hold a gun to my head, I'd say this is going to be a two, three, four year grind of things getting marginally better, but it's, it's not, nothing's going to happen quickly overnight. You hit on it earlier, Morgan, the, uh, the supply chain. Like I think people talk a lot about inventory and the mortgage rates. It's kind of like the two factors that are really kind of driving the situation right now. The um, supply chain is really interesting. You touched on garage doors. We covered that a little while back, and I actually have some personal experience with this. I was in a rush, had my baby in the back seat, and backed out, hit the bottom panel of my garage door. I told Zach all about this months ago. <laughs> it took forever to get this last panel. Yeah. It was the middle of winter in Massachusetts and it was freezing. We were trying to get this thing in there. It took like three months to get one panel for a very standard garage door that you would think would be super easy. It was crazy. A really simple thing. And all of us, virtually everyone listening to this right now has lived in a world for their entire life where every piece of equipment was readily available instantly. Doesn't matter what you need, you need a new a new spare part for anything, it's available today. And all of a sudden the last two years, it just completely shifted where there's a lot of things, particularly in the construction space, where you're not looking at a one month wait, you're looking at a one year wait. You're looking at an 18 month wait. And that is so foreign to how we've lived our lives. And it's so foreign to how supply chains were built. The, the big manufacturing change in the last 20 or 30 years has been just-in-time manufacturing, where there is not warehouses of spare parts waiting to be sold. It's when somebody puts an order in for a garage door that is like shipped from China that day or wherever it's, it's built, and it comes to you just in time. There's no warehouse of stock waiting. And because of that, there's just so little room for error. There's so little slack in the system that when you have a minor hic- a minor hiccup, everything breaks. And then you have a major hiccup like COVID and it's just like completely shattered the whole system. So, but th- things are getting better. Like the like supply chains today compared to last fall are way better, but they are still completely broken relative to where they were in 2019 before COVID. What role do you think the tangential trend of stagnating wages uh, plays into this. What's interesting is that stagnating wages, particularly for the bottom half of income earners, was the most important economic story for 40 years, from the early 1980s to the late 2010s. By far, that was the most powerful trend, the most disruptive, harmful trend, full stop, for a whole generation, two generations. For the last couple of years, in percentage terms, The segment of the economy that has had the highest wage growth are the lowest income earners. Complete flip of trend from where we used to be for 40 years. It used to be the rich people doubled their income every couple of years and everyone else, good luck in real terms, adjusted for inflation, your wages are going down. Now you have in the last couple of years, really interesting trends where people who used to make $8 an hour and had been making $8 an hour for 20 years, all of a sudden those people are making $15 an hour, $20 an hour. Not everyone, I don't want to paint too broad of a brush here, but across a lot of industries, that was the case. A really interesting thing was the political push for a $15 minimum wage has been like so fierce and people are so uh, firm in their beliefs pro or against that. In practical terms, without passing any national law, minimum wage today is $15 an hour. Because if you are a business that wants to hire people, you're not going to get anyone for less than $15 an hour. No one's going to apply if you're paying less than that. So there has been a big rise in wages across lower income groups. Now that is a group of people, a very large group of people that was suppressed for 40 years. So even if there is a lot of growth over the last two years, it's nowhere near 
where it needs to be or what they feel is adequate or keeping up with 40 years of inflation. Like it's, it's nothing close to where it needs to be. Or, or the 320 X growth in CEO pay over the same time period. It's, it's still, it's still flip, but there is a, if you look over a long period, a hundred and 150 years, there's, there's these things usually go in like 20 or 30 year cycles where the groups that are favored in the economy goes from the very rich and then it flips. And then the groups that are favored are the lower income workers. You know, there was a period from, uh, the 1930s through call it 1980s, a, a, a half century period where the highest income Americans, their incomes did not grow that much. And the lowest income Americans, their incomes grew substantially. And it's that seems so foreign today, but there's been these trends historically um, where, where it goes like that. And before that period was 50 years where the rich got insanely rich and the poor were barely struggling to feed themselves. It's always just goes in these cycles. If we are at the cusp of a new cycle and have been for the last two years where lower income Americans, and let's just call that the bottom half of income earners, if they are going to be in a more favorable cycle in percentage terms than the top half, that would not surprise me. I don't know if it's the case. I don't have, it's, it's, I don't have too firm a beliefs about that, but it would not surprise me just off the fact that we went almost half a century where it was the other way around. And these things tend to like good news and bad news can't persist indefinitely. These, like all these things are cyclical and it was so heavily weighted around 2019 towards lower income workers. You're screwed. There's nothing left for you. Here's a couple bucks. Good luck for you, pal. And upper income earner, earners was just sky's the limit. You can earn billions of dollars a year. It was like the skew between the groups was so extreme that it would not surprise me in the slightest if the trends now are towards the other way around. And, and, to, and to your question, like what does that do like stagnant wages or, 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 or the opposite of that? What does that do to housing? So far, any income growth for lower income workers has by far in a way been out been stripped out by rising home prices. If your income goes from $8 to $15 an hour, but an entry level house goes from 200 to 500,000, doesn't doesn't make that much of a difference, particularly when interest rates are rising because that's going to impact the monthly payment on it. So even if you have rising wages, what's gone on in housing in the last 2 years is just outstripped everything. The only people who can keep up with it are people who owned like tech stocks and crypto for the last 2 years. It's the only people whose financial resources have kept up with housing prices. Yeah. And you mentioned, uh, you know, we, we talked a little bit about interest rates. You know, I, that's another example of something where you can kind of zoom out and maybe the story is different. Interest rates have become a little bit of a scapegoat right now with a lot of younger buyers who are struggling to get into the market. But if you zoom out there, what do you see with interest rates? Well, it, it used to be, let's go back to not that long ago when the three of us were uh, kids, young teens, the 1990s. Not that long ago. This is not ancient history. A mortgage rate on a house in the 1990s was 7%, 8% in the early 1990s. And that was just the norm. That's what it was. I don't think, my impression is that when you, if you bought a house in 1993 and your mortgage rate was 8%, you did not say, oh my God, this crazy interest rate, this is insane. You just said, yeah, that's what a mortgage costs. Now that seems preposterous to us today because today we're like 5%. Oh my gosh, the world's coming to an end because we got so addicted to the idea that a mortgage rate was 3% or maybe 4%. And so we are so, there's been such a huge shift towards anchoring and uh, and expecting and relying on very low interest rates. That if you look at it, interest rates today that have surged, quote unquote, to five or 6% over any historical comparison, those are very, very low interest rates. I'm not saying that interest rates are going to go back to eight. I don't think any, no one can make that kind of prediction. But when, when we got used to interest rates at 3%, housing prices adjusted accordingly because it was so cheap to finance the mortgage that the housing price could double in value. You could have a half million dollar entry price home because mortgage rates were so low. And now that if mortgage rates creep up, even if they just stay where they are now, the calculus on that utterly changes. Like just because of what interest rates have done over the last year, I think the median mortgage payment for a new house in America has gone up by $800 a month just in the last year. That is a ton of money for the huge majority of Americans. That is a life-changing amount of money that happened just because of what interest rates did in the last year. Now, if there is, if interest rates stay where they are, you can't have home prices where they are indefinitely. People just can't afford it. And this is why you have seen in the last two or three months, the number of homes that are listed for sale at quote unquote market prices that don't get any bids, just sit on the market for months and months is exploding. 
where I live around Seattle, I feel like it used to be a year ago, if a house went on the market, it was, it was sold within the, the hour is what it felt like. And, and, and literally, maybe that's an exaggeration, but literally it was sold within two or three days. And now if a house goes on the market, the first sale sign sits in front of that house for months. Houses that went on the market in May, they're, they're not going anywhere. And the reason is because they are being priced and valued. The, 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 the asking sales price is pretending like we still live in a world with 3% interest rates. But now the interest rates are 5 or 6%. Now you have these houses that it's like, it's not even that nice of a house. It's an okay house in Seattle, but the monthly payment, if you were to buy it at today's interest rates, would be $20,000 a month. It's some of the, like, you look at the disconnect. I've, my wife and I have run some of these numbers and we are like, that house for sale down the street, if you were to buy that, the monthly payment, your mortgage payment would be $20,000 a month for that house, for that junker house. It's crazy. And so that's why those houses just aren't selling. Granted, you and I live in very hot markets, but these concepts scale down, uh, you know, to the heartland states. Oh, totally. As wages go down. Um, Absolutely. But yeah, but yeah I've, I've noticed the same thing in the Bay Area. Days on market way up. You see houses 20, 30, 40 days on the market that were selling probably in four or five days before. If that. I mean, we, we sold a house in Virginia in April of 2020, which was peak COVID panic meltdown. It was That was when everyone was panicking. And we sold our house in Virginia. It was on the market for 24 hours. A hundred people came over to look at it and it got seven bids in 24 hours. And that was my first indication that like housing is like, this is, this is a different world. And what's crazy is that we don't, nobody calls today's market, the housing bubble. I think we're, we're too caught up in other, we're, we're too busy thinking about other things, but by almost any met, not any metric, there are a couple that, that are very far from it, but by a lot of metrics, what's going on today is equal, if not exceeding what was going on in housing during the housing bubble of the early 2000s. The major difference is the quality of mortgages that are being made. It used to be that anyone with a heartbeat and a smile could get a mortgage, and it's not like that at all today. But price-wise and how quickly things go and the bidding wars are crazy. The last anecdote that I'll share that I think is crazy, and this was last summer, I had a friend who bid, I think, 30% over asking price on a house, and the realtor told him that he was the lowest of six bids on the house. And that was 30% over the asking price. He was the lowest of six. Well, it's yeah. funny what you say. So Morgan, my, yeah. my mother-in-law is a um, real estate agent. And so the way that she's kind of talking about it right now is sellers are kind of looking at the news around inventory and they're like, there's no inventory. So I can price this kind of however I want it. But then buyers are looking at the increased rates and they're kind of like, well, that price that you're listing it at might've made sense like six months ago, but now it makes absolutely no sense at all. And so we have this kind of like stalemate between sellers and buyers. It's gotta be like the most challenging little window to be a real estate agent right now. Like, I don't know what I would tell my clients. <laughs> yeah, I, I imagine it's really painful for the psychology of right. sellers. When in your head, you're like, my house is worth X. I go into Zillow and Zillow says it's worth a million dollars, whatever. And then, but in reality, given where interest rates, you're like, no, it's probably worth 30% less than that. You think it's worth a million, it's worth 700. But now in your head, you just lost. And, and by the way, maybe this is for a house that you paid 500 grand for. I'm making all this up. But like you paid 500, you thought it was a million, but maybe it's actually 700. In your head, you just lost $300,000 right. and you do not want to admit that. You want to blame your realtor. You want to say, no, I'm going to hold out for a good buyer. And a lot of these people I think are like, I think the majority of people with for sale signs in front of their house right now are in denial is the, 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 the only way to put it. A rhetorical question, but I, I do wonder what the long-term effects of these inflated comps are going to be. I mean, it, it breaks eventually. Like once the dam starts breaking and you have, you have sellers who are like, I need to move. I need to move today. What's the market price? Just take it. Then you start getting more comps. Like that's the crazy thing about realtor, about real estate is that it's all based off of comps. Whereas in the stock market, it's based off of like, what is somebody willing to pay at this second? Not, not what was Apple stock worth six months ago. It's what is someone willing to pay at this very moment? Whereas in real estate, exactly. the yeah. pricing is based off of, well, what did this house sell for six months ago? Well, the world was very different six months ago. But once you get a couple of comps of people that are living in reality, people who are like, I need to sell, what's the price? The price is 700 grand to go back to our example. Once those comps come in, history would show that these things tend to break pretty quickly because then all the comps are back to reality and then people and then it's just like everything starts flooding in yeah rob i'd be curious to to hear if your family member has seen kind of a, a failure to downshift into reality from sellers um is is the great readjustment yeah. happening yet i mean that i think everyone's that waiting for? her issue with her issue 
during the pandemic was really with buyers who I think like Morgan, you mentioned your friend who bid 30% over and was the lowest. Like I heard a million stories like that from my mother-in-law. Like she had so many buyers who were kind of in the same shoes and it was like, they were making all cash offers. They were going like 20 to 30% over. And then somebody would come along with a bigger offer and waive the inspection and like do all this crazy stuff. That's like really ignorant, like practices in real estate, honestly, and would end up getting the house. And now it seems like the challenge is with sellers, exactly, because they don't want to back off of those prices that they've been seeing a few months ago. Exactly to your point, Morgan, with the with the psychology part of it. It's like you've kind of locked yourself into this idea that you're going to make a certain amount off of this house. You keep hearing about how few houses are on the market, and it's just hard to adjust there for sure. Someone brought up this idea the other day that I thought was really interesting, which is how much power Zillow has over the American psyche. Because, they really do. Yeah. Because 65% of Americans that own a house – a huge percentage of them log into Zillow and they're like, oh, my house is worth, wow, that's more than I thought. I'm richer than I thought. I have hundreds of thousands of dollars more in net worth than I thought. And that's just based off of an algorithm that some 23-year-old in Seattle like <laughs> plugged into a spreadsheet. And then they yeah. go to sell and they realize that that algorithm might be disconnected from reality a little bit. And all of a sudden they are absolutely crushed. And it's like Zillow is literally singularly responsible for trillions, tens of trillions of dollars in American psyche. And that if they are off by a couple percentage points, like they've ruined the psychology of American families because of it. Yeah. It's a great, it's a great point. And I think a broader point, just like I buyers in general, uh, who come up with these algorithms of pricing homes, you know, we've seen some rude awakenings in the past few years in the I buying space, uh, with those estimates being off and the investments falling short. Exactly. It's a, it's a, it's a tough thing. And also back to like, if you compare the stock market, there is one price for Apple stock today. It's traded on an exchange and you, you can go on and see the, like the price of Apple stock. Whereas what is the price of a, of a three bedroom house in America? Like there's a billion different prices. Everything is different. So because it's so dispersed and so disparate and it's based off of so many different factors, Versus a stock market where it's, there's just one price every day and you get these, these crazy skews. And I think it just takes longer for things to adjust in that world. If, if Apple re has a bad news release today, the stock price will fall today. Whereas with housing, if interest rates rise, it might take six months before people wake up to reality. Yeah. And it's funny too, to kind of peel back the onion a little bit and see some of the methodologies behind home valuations, like hedonic pricing models where you know, you break down how much is this extra bathroom worth? How much is this extra bedroom worth? How much is this tree in my yard worth? That you can get that granular. Um, but it's not, a lot of that really isn't rooted in kind of scientific methodology. It's just uh, based on market precedence or whatever. And, and the other thing about housing that's so crazy, when my wife and I bought our first house, it was 2016. And we went into this being like, okay, we are not going to be emotional about this. This is not an emotional decision. We're going to go look at some houses, but we're not going to fall in love with anything. We're going to make a calm, rational decision. The first house we pulled up to, we pulled up in the driveway and my wife says, I love it. And it was like at that, at that moment, of course, it's, of course, it's an emotional decision. And I felt the same way. I'm not putting this on her, but I felt the same way too. So this is not like buying a new washing machine where you're like, just look at the stats, buy the most efficient one. We'll be calm about it. Housing is such an emotional, like, I'm going to raise my kids here. We're going to have Christmas morning with my children in this house. Of course, I'm emotional about this decision. And you see this a lot, particularly during a hot, a hot housing market where you don't have a week to make this decision. If you want to buy the house, you got to write, write a check right now. You don't have time to think about this, that you're making a very emotional decision with your life savings, and you need to make that at this very moment right now. Of course, people screw up that decision and make regrettable decisions. How much is Christmas morning <laughs> worth to you on the hedonic pricing scale? Totally, <laughs> totally. And the cost of moving is so much that if you end up buying a house that you regret, and then you're like, oh, I regret this house. Let's sell it and move to another one. Okay, now you got to pay realtors 6% right. and you got to hire the right, movers right. to come. Like Everyone knows that moving is one of the most god-awful things you can do in life. It's so painful. Yeah, we've tried to, Morgan, you mentioned you and your wife looking at comps in the neighborhood. Like we've tried to run those, like we've tried to look for the arbitrage opportunities ourselves. So I, I own a house like 45 minutes outside Boston and we've tried to figure this out. I think the luckiest people in this situation are the ones who have like, they have their kind of home where they raise their family and then they have some vacation home somewhere and their kids just graduate. Their final kid just graduated high school. They're finally empty nesters and they could sell that house and just like go hang out in their second house. Like those people are making off like bandits right now. It's unbelievable. 
Yeah, there there definitely are people, and you know, the I, I think the the anecdotes that people throw around are true about the the baby boomers who bought a house in 1983, and their entry level house, even adjusted for inflation, costs them the equivalent of like a hundred grand, <laughs> and then and then living it for their entire life. There are there are big generational differences, and I really emphasize I I really empathize with um, young millennials or older Gen Z right now that are in the housing market for the first time. It's, totally. it's the worst it's ever been if you're in the market for the first time. There's no precedent in any American history of being worse than it is right now if you're looking for a new house. Uh, uplifting stuff for me. <laughs> yeah, my, my, my mom, uh, it was a, you know, she's a high school teacher. She earned fifty sixty thousand dollars $60,000 for most of her career. Um, bought a house in 2000 for $500,000 in a great neighborhood in California. Put down maybe ten thousand dollar down payment, um, and at the time, you know, her neighbor was a carpenter. Guy across the street was an electrician. Lo- you know, lots of uh, blue collar, uh, a mix of people in the neighborhood. It's a totally different landscape now. You, the guy across the street is an investment banker. Guy a few doors down works at Salesforce. He's an EVP at Salesforce. You know, it's just uh, a different world. My mom's house is probably. You know, according to Zilla's highly accurate estimate, it's worth about two million dollars now. Yeah. Um, but I can't imagine getting into a neighborhood like that now. Especially the other element about this that really discourages young people from buying a new house is one of the big trends of the last decade was the construction of luxury apartment buildings, a lot of which are very, very nice. They're not bad places to live. This is not a cockroach infested, peeling paint apartment building. These are like luxury hotel resorts that you can rent an apartment in. And every major city in America has a has hundred of these places. So now that you compare it, let's say you're 25 and you're like, I want to go out and buy a house. And okay, now you have two options. You can stay in your luxury apartment and pay rent, or you can go live in a complete shoebox that you're going to have to go into a million dollars of debt for and fix the plumbing yourself and deal with all the issues. Those are your two options. A lot of people I know are like, I'd rather stay in the luxury apartment. Even if like, look, in theory, I would love to buy. I don't want to rent anymore. But if those are my two options, stay in the luxury hotel villa or go live in a roach infested 800 square foot falling apart, broken plumbing house down the street that I have to go into a million dollars of debt to buy. It's a much easier decision. Well, this kind of leads into my the next question. The the rent to price ratio is like off the charts right now. And, and that's essentially a measure of the ratio of home prices to annualized rents in a given location. Does it make sense for younger people just to be renting right now? I also, I said, my, my wife and I bought our house, our first house in 2016. At the time we were in our early mid thirties and we had a infant son, our, our first child. We were completely fine, a hundred percent great with renting up until that point. So our entire twenties and early thirties, we were not. It was we were not being burdened by rent. It was great. We moved from city to city, kind of figuring out what we were doing with our life. It was wonderful. I don't regret it in the slightest. As soon, I think, as soon as we had our our son, our first child, then it was like, I want my own place. If only for like, I want to get out of apartments because babies make a lot of noise 24 hours a day. And I don't want to feel like I'm waking up my neighbors all the time. I want my own house where my child can scream at the top of his lungs whenever he wants to. I think that was honestly our main push for it was just a greater sense of like, this is our space to raise our family. But I don't regret renting at all. I think it was the greatest thing that we did. My wife and I lived in, I think, five cities throughout our 20s and early 30s. My wife, we we moved from my wife's grad school and whatnot. If we had owned a house at any point in that time, we would have been much more anchored down than we were. So I don't regret it at all. But I I would also say that now in my mid to late 30s, home ownership, now we have two kids, is one of the most important things to me in the world. And if I had two kids and we were renting an apartment that we might get kicked out of at any given moment because it's sold to a private equity firm or whatever, that would freak me out. So it just, it just depends what stage in your life you're at. I've changed a lot. I'm sure it's the same for you guys too and everyone listening. As you age, there's a big difference between 25 and 35 in terms of what you want and where you're going and what you value. So that's, that's as always how I look at the, the rental to buy decision. And I want to try to work in some of the principles from your book, but you've said, you've said a lot that insecurity is an asset. Um, what exactly do you mean by that? And how might that idea play into how you're thinking about the housing market right now? Well, just, just the idea. I mean, I've always been a, a, a worrier and I've always been a, a worst case scenario kind of guy. In a lot of ways, that's, that's bad. I think it's given me a level of stress 
not 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 crippling stress, but a level of stress that I look back and I'm like, I, I, I wish I would have been a little bit calmer. But I also think having a level of fear and a mild grade of paranoia in your financial life is a really healthy thing just to keep you cognizant of how the world works, especially after you've been through a period when things are pretty good when the stock market booms and crypto booms and everything's going pretty well, it's easy to just extrapolate that in the future and say, everything's going to be great. Extrapolate your career into the future and extrapolate your stock market winnings. Just be like, everything's great. My paranoid personality has always been almost the opposite of like when things are going good, that's when I'm like, oh, everything's going to end tomorrow. Um, as it's kind of been my mindset. And I think a low dose of that is actually really healthy just to make sure that you're not being overextended, that you're aware of the risks that are out there. And so my quote unquote paranoia has meant that I've had, you know, very little, if any debt and a pretty high level of cash relative to the rest of our assets. So that when something like March of 2020 rolls around and the world is falling apart at the seams, bursting at the seams, it was, it was scary for my wife and I, like everyone else, but it, it, I'd never felt like I, we were in any sort of financial jeopardy. And I think that is really important. If you understand like the power of compounding, it's returns to the power of time. So the exponent is time. What really matters and does all of the heavy lifting in compound interest is just how long you're doing it for. It's just time. So if you can stick around for a long period of time, you will do very well at investing in real estate and stocks, whatever it is. But you need to be able, be able you need to ensure that you can survive all the crazy ups and downs to stick around for as long as you can and not get kicked out of the game. So that's why I, that's why I think insecurity can be an asset. It's just, it pushes you closer to reality. There's this theory in psychology called depressive realism, which is that depressed people have a much more accurate view of the world than happy people. Depressed people understand, <laughs> they understand, yeah, they understand how fragile the Finally world is. Finally a win for me. <laughs> they understand how fragile the world is. They understand that everything can break at a moment's notice. They understand that your loved ones might leave you. They might die. They The, the people who are depressed have a much firmer grasp on reality than happy people that just see rainbows and kittens around every corner. That's that's interesting. I mean, how do you kind of weigh that with this idea that you should invest like an optimist? Um, those two things kind of seem to be at odds, but maybe not. I think no. I think they are at odds, but you need to learn how to get them to coexist with each other. I always so the the first part of that quote was save like a pessimist and invest like an optimist. You need to do both of those things at the same time. So I've always been a worrier and. A, you know, a little bit paranoid in the short run, but I invest like an optimist. So my high savings rate and my worry about things in life has never once interrupted my long-term investments. And I think having that barbell personality of like, on one hand, I'm really nervous and paranoid and I want a lot of cash and no debt on one hand. And on the other hand, I'm like, I'm investing in stocks for the next 50 years because I am so optimistic that people all over the world will become more productive and solve problems and get better at what we're doing. And that's going to accrue to me as an investor. You need to have both of those things at the, at the same time. And people view optimism, pessimism, like it's black or white, like you need to be one or the other. And you look like you're contradicting yourself. If like I just said, I'm paranoid on one hand, but I'm a huge optimist on the other. You have to get both of those at the same time. And since it's contradictory, people don't like that cognitive dissonance of like, having two personalities in your head, but it's so critical to, again, if you want to get rich, you need to compound over the long period of time. But if you want to stick around for a long period of time, you need to be paranoid about surviving all the chaos and uncertainty of the short run. What's that quote? The, uh, the test of intelligence is being able to hold two ideas in your head at the same time or something like that. I think it's like F Scott. Yeah, Fitzgerald, it's, maybe. it's yeah. true. Yeah. I, I, I think that's right. And, um, yeah, like everyone wants really clean black and white answers to things, but almost everything important in life is really complex and complicated. And there's no, it's all, it's, it's all in the gray zone. Absolutely. Taking things back to housing a little bit, I, I want to ask you to hypothesize a little bit here. Um, but do you think that we are going to see a wave of regret from first time home buyers who maybe got into the market because of FOMO last year? Yeah, I, I, I think that's that's completely unavoidable. I think it's not, particularly in cities like Seattle where I am and in the Bay Area and whatnot, I think it's it's very likely that you're going to have people who buy a house and a year or two later, that house is realistically worth 30 or 40 or 50% less than they paid for it. Now, for some of them, that will just be like a psychological ding. They'll just feel silly about it. But others of them will get divorced or need to relocate for a job opportunity and they need to sell that house and it's worth a tiny, it's worth a fraction of what they bought it for. And some of those people might be 
um, technically bankrupt at that point. I mean, you know, you can do short sales and whatnot, but there are there, there, there's going to be people who are financially ruined because of that. And I, you can say that with confidence because that's how this always plays out. There's never, there's no historical, you know, when, when, whenever there's a big run up in prices and things seem like a quote unquote bubble, ev- the, the easy response is like, oh, maybe it was a bubble, but things will probably just plateau here for a while. And that's just not how things are. There's very little plateauing in financial markets. It's always in some state of boom or bust. There's very, there's really little flat lines. And so after you had a period in real estate, like the last two years, I, I would not bet on it just plateauing from here. I would bet on maybe not nationwide and maybe not in, uh, you know, you know it'll be different degrees in, in cities. But I look at Seattle and the Bay Area, just because what I'm most familiar with, as like, it would not surprise me in the slightest if you have home prices that fall 30% or more. Just because, and that's not crazy. If home prices in Seattle fell 30%, it would bring us back to where we were like, Last April, <laughs> right. like it's not. It's not crazy. It's, these are not crazy predictions that we're making. So, isn't that nuts? Right. Yeah. I mean, if home prices fell fifty percent, it would bring us back to where we were two mm-hmm. years ago. Sheesh. It's not crazy. Sure. It's not crazy. crazy. And two years ago, when people were buying houses two years ago, they were not saying, "Oh, this is so cheap." They were saying, "This is actually pretty expensive." And that's what fifty percent would bring us back to. Now, there's been income growth since then. The stock market is higher since then, so people have more wealth to spend on housing. So maybe it's not fifty percent. 30%, not crazy in the slightest, particularly with where interest rates are. Yeah, I like to uh, frequent the Reddit has a first time home buyer subreddit. And, uh, you know, there's been a rash of posts on there recently of young buyers from last year, maybe all over the place, say someone in the Midwest who bought a home last year during the frenzy. And they're just, they, they're they posting about their disappointment and they're kind of regretting it a little bit and, and stepping back and saying, I thought the house was going to solve, you know, all of these concerns that I had in my mind, but um, it's really just introduced a whole nother potpourri of concerns for me. Yeah. I mean, and made things more challenging. I mean, at the, at the most rational level, a house is a pile of dirt with rotting lumber and cracked brick that is just consistently falling apart is what a house is. And you don't realize, I think when you live in a big apartment building that is relatively new and somebody else is doing all the maintenance, it is so easy to underestimate how much work a 60 year old house needs. It's constant. So true. It is a constant that the number, if once you're a homeowner, like the most, you will go to home Depot more than you go to the grocery store. You're, you are 100%. more familiar with home Depot than you are with Safeway. And yeah. <laughs> it's, it's very easy to not understand that until you are a first time homeowner. Not only is there literally always something yeah. like some project, there's literally always a competing list of projects. It's like, Oh, I could, I could be doing this or we could fix this or we could do that. It's, it's endless. It's like every weekend. It's like many of which, on here? many of which will become like the most expensive things you've, you've ever purchased. <laughs> right, like, Oh, how much right, does it, exactly. how much does it cost to fix right. a cracked foundation? A hundred thousand dollars. I'm like, like what? Yeah. Like, that's like completely different scale of costs than you're used to. It's crazy. Yeah. 